Brothers and sisters, to form a basis of our brother Nathan Lewis's words of exhortation, I now for, call forward our brother Peter Gill to read for us 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 to 16. Reading with you 1 Corinthians chapter 2, commencing at verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have en entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of, the, the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? We now look forward to the words of exhortation by our brother Nathan, continuing his consideration of the mind of Christ, with a consideration this morning on the promise the spiritual mind. Well, thanks, Brother Mike, and good morning, my very dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, and our brother Colin and sister Judy. We love you, and our thoughts and prayers are with you at this time. You will remember, hopefully from last night, that we looked at the problem that faces each one of us. As we attempt to have the mind of Christ in us, this awful, selfish, destructive way of thinking that is in direct enmity with God, the carnal mind, what Brother Thomas calls a hideous deformity. And you'll remember we looked at the three parts of our human brain in a rather well, a somewhat simplistic, rudimentary way, but hopefully in a way that was helpful to see how our brains work as they really hijack our thinking. We react instinctively, often long before we actually think. In fact, a scary 95% of the time. Almost instantly, our instinctive brain is able to monopolize all the oxygen and nutrients and our thinking brain can't work even if it wants to. This is our problem. A brain or a mind which is naturally totally obsessed about itself. Self-preservation, self-gratification, self-enjoyment. And it takes over our thinking almost instantaneously. Now I hope that towards the end of last night you were starting to feel pretty awful. To the point where you were able to exclaim with the Apostle Paul, Oh, wretched man that I am. Who is able to deliver me from this body of death? Who is able to take away this reptilian way of thinking? But I hope from what we looked at last night, you didn't think, as we said last night, that the carnal mind is just a physiological or anatomical thing. That if we concentrate on thinking a little more, on exercising this top part of our brain, we can dominate, conquer, cure the carnal mind. The carnal mind is not just a physical thing. It is not just the wrong chemicals in the wrong place at the wrong time. Brother Thomas puts it this way in Alpha Israel on page 89. Let me read it to you. In the absence of this law and testimony, the moral sentiments are 
as incapable of directing a man aright as though he were all intellect or propensities. By a right direction, I mean according to the mind of God. The sentiments are as blind as the propensities when intellect is unenlightened by divine revelation. All three parts of the human brain are carnal. All three parts can be equally empty of spiritual thinking. All three parts can be equally useless at directing our paths. The spiritual mind is not the analytical brain. It's true that the mind of Christ cannot inhabit any other part of our mind. It's true that when the mind of Christ dwells in us richly through faith, that it lives in this thinking part of our mind. But see the important part? Divine revelation. The law and the testimony. The entering in of the mind of God. The spiritual mind is the mind of God inhabiting our thinking. And it's only this combination of both that is able to to at least in part have victory over the carnal mind. Now we were in Genesis last night, but I'd like to start again in Genesis chapter 3 this morning and look at the carnal mind again and see this time, not just physiologically how it works, but morally how it defiles. How does sin happen in our minds? And as we know, Eve is the prototype of how sin develops in our minds. Let's just read these verses once more that we know so well in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat, and the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. Now look at this process. The first thing we want to note is that a changed way of thinking always starts with a question. See verse 1. Hath God said? The serpent introduces doubt into the mind of Eve. Do you know Eve in verse 3 is confident in what God has said. God hath said, but the serpent introduces doubt. Remember what we said last night from 1 Corinthians 11? You might be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The serpent introduces doubt. And look what the serpent did. I want you to consider the three parts of our brain. Do you know there are three reasons for why we will do anything? And maybe, unsurprisingly now... They correlate to the three parts of our brains. Firstly, we can be driven by lusts. That's our instincts. That's this back part of our brain, the reptilian part that we talked about last night. Our basic default setting. It's how we are hardwired. We want, so we take. But then we can be, we can be motivated secondarily by fear. That's our emotions, the middle part of our brain. And fear is more powerful than lust. You can desperately lust after something, but you won't touch it 
If you're scared stiff, you'll be caught. That's Eve. That's what she says. We can't even touch it. This is how dictators rule. Fear. It's an extremely powerful driver for behavior. It's how the Roman Catholics controlled the masses in the middle part of the Middle Ages. Fear of not going to heaven will make you avoid lusts. But you see, there is a third and far more potent driver for our behavior, and it's called love. And perfect love can cast out fear. It's stronger than fear. You can overcome temptation or lust by fear of the consequences, but nothing will overcome doing the wrong thing more than loving the right thing. Now see how the serpent and his thinking unravels and sabotages Eve's thinking. Because don't forget, in verses 2 and 3, she tells the truth, doesn't she, by and large? She tells what God had said. How does she become deceived? Well, firstly, in verse 4, the serpent is going to remove Eve's fear. Ye shall not surely die. Possibly, the serpent was chewing on the fruit himself as he said this. We don't know, but remember, he was not morally accountable to God's law. Don't be afraid, he says. It's not as you think. It's safe. God doesn't really mean what he says. The consequences aren't what you think at all. Look at me. I'm touching the fruit. You won't die. And he contradicted God with impunity. He removed Eve's fear of the consequences. And secondly, in verse 5, he removed Eve's love for God. God doesn't actually care about you the way that you think. He doesn't want you to eat the fruit because he doesn't want you to be equal to him. He's not telling you everything. He's actually deceiving you to keep you in your place. He doesn't want to share immortality. He's not to be trusted as you thought. Go on, go on. Not only is it not bad, it's going to be amazing. You're missing out. You deserve it. Now, the serpent clearly didn't say out loud any of these things. But we know, don't we, that Eve is saying all of these things in her mind, unconsciously, instantaneously. Two milliseconds and her thinking brain is being hijacked. And so we can clearly see what happened to Eve with her love for God removed and her fear of the consequences removed. She simply fell victim to lust, the carnal mind. The three lusts of first of John 2 that we know so well, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, And the pride of life, they're all there as we know in verse 6. It was all that was left in the mind of Eve. And she ate, and Adam ate as well. She lost her love and her trust in God. Essentially, she lost her faith. And so we learn that the carnal mind is characterized by an absence of, or a loss of, faith. That's why Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And Romans 8 verse 3 says, They that are in the flesh cannot please him. Because the thinking of the flesh is the absence of faith. It's us losing trust in God. And Eve catastrophically lost her faith in God. And so the thinking of the spirit, the spiritual mind is all about the presence of faith. It's all about restoring our love, our trust in Him. It's all about Him. In fact, it's got nothing to do with us, nothing to do with our intellectual brilliance, whereby we might conquer our own carnal minds and achieve in our own strength a spiritual mind. No, it's all about Him. Nothing to do with our willpower, nothing to do with our strength. 
But before we get to this, let's just look at the result of the fall. Sin was going to bring into the world what we know from the New Testament as a defiled conscience. Look at verses 9 and 10. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. The carnal mind is characterized by these three things. Fear, shame, and concealment. I was afraid. I hid myself because I was naked. Where these three things are, there is a defiled conscience. This is the inevitable result of the carnal mind. It defiles. Now in Alpha's Israel, Brother Thomas goes on to say these words, and I'll read them again to you. The reader, by contemplating Adam and Eve in their innocency, and afterwards in their guilt, will perceive in the facts of their case the nature of a good conscience and an evil one. When they rejoiced in the answer of a good conscience, they were destitute of shame and fear. They could stand naked in God's presence, unabashed, and instead of trembling at his voice, they rejoiced to hear it as the harbinger of good things. They were then pure and undefiled, being devoid of all conscience of sin. But mark the change that afterward came over them. When they lost their good conscience, terror seized upon them at the voice of God, and shame possessed their souls, and they sought to get out of his sight, and to remove as far from him as possible. Now what was the cause of this? There is but one answer that can be given, and that is sin. Alpha's Israel, page 85 to 86. And so entered the carnal mind into the history of the world. It was not just the victory of our instincts and emotion over the thinking brain. It was now a morally defiled and corrupt conscience. That's a much bigger problem. What was the answer? Well, Brother Thomas says, it's obvious. If sin is the morbid principle of an evil conscience, what is the obvious indication to be fulfilled in its removal? The answer is, blot out the sin. And the conscience of the patient will be cured. The morbid phenomenon will disappear and the answer of a good conscience will remain. If sin brings an evil conscience or the carnal mind, then forgiveness by God can only have one result, a good conscience, a spiritual mind. It was simple, wasn't it? So simple. So obvious. Just forgive the sin. Well, the only problem was that forgiveness could only be brought about, as we know, in God's righteousness, by an undefiled, perfect sacrifice. A mind that in itself had never sinned. Never given in to the thinking of the carnal mind. And so the story of the scriptures is all about that search for one man. God's solution was obvious and simple. Forgive. But the perfect sacrifice to bring about that forgiveness was very difficult to find. So allow me to introduce to you an interesting theme in the scriptures which you can look up and look into in your own time. We don't have time to explore it today, but it's called the No Man Prophecies. As God searched the world for a righteous offering to take away sin, he could find no man. Just to whet your appetite, here's a couple to get you started. Psalm 142 and verse 4. No man would know me. No man cared for my soul. It's right through Isaiah's servant songs, 41 and verse 28. There was no man, no counselor. Isaiah 50 verse 2, there was no man, none to answer. Isaiah 59 verse 16, no man 
No intercessor. And finally, we come to Revelation chapter 5, verse 3. No man could open the book. The no man prophecies are all about God's search for a saviour. And that saviour is Christ. Now, I want to touch down in the Gospels again in the presence of Christ. And I want you to come to Mark chapter 5, because in the story of Legion, we have a no man prophecy. And I think you're going to find that Mark chapter 5 and the story of Legion is an extremely insightful parable into the way that our Lord deals with and replaces the carnal mind. You remember last night we looked, didn't we, at the story of the epileptic boy as a parable of the carnal mind. Remember that? He cast himself into the fire and the water. He was intent on destroying himself. And if there is a better parable to illustrate the carnal mind than the epileptic boy, it's right here in Mark chapter 5 and the story of Legion. Just look how Legion perfectly demonstrates the carnal mind. We read in verse 1, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him one out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. The very first information we get about Legion is he's out of the tombs. He's associated with death. Graves. Dead bodies. Literally, the word means memorials. These are burial monuments. This man's living in the past. There's no present. There's no future. He's surrounded by and intimately related with. Verse 3 says he's living amongst death. He's got an unclean spirit. Verse 2. The Greek word is akathato, it means without. Purity. This man is defiled. Defiled. And verse 3 says, No man, no man could bind him. There's a no man prophecy. He was unrestrainable. He's looking for a savior, but there's no man. Even chains could not keep this man in check. He is absolutely without restraint uncontrollable. This is the carnal mind. Sometimes in verse 4, the lid goes on for a little time, but the fetters and chains are useless and he breaks free. We find at the end of verse 4, neither could any man tame him. It's different from verse 3, no man could bind him. Now it's no man can tame him. It's the Greek word demazo. It means to domesticate. No man could cure him. No one could integrate him back into society. He could not be rehabilitated. This is the carnal mind. Untamable, wild. Verse 5 says, He's always night and day in the mountains. You get the sense, don't you, that there's no relief for this poor man. It's always night and day. No break. This man is afflicted. He's tormented, verse 7. He cannot escape his condition. He carries it with him in his mind. And he's in the mountains. Do you remember our first attribute from the portrait of the carnal mind last night? Ephesians 4, verse 18. Alienated. Colossians 1, verse 21. Alienated. Ezekiel 23, verse 17 alienated in our minds. This man cannot be domesticated. He cannot be bound. He must be banished. Isolated from everyone else. Alone. This is what the carnal mind does to us. Again, in verse 5, he's in the tombs. In fact, we're told that three times, aren't we? In the tombs, in the tombs, in the tombs. Associated with death, death, death. He's crying in verse 5. He's desperate for a solution. He knows his plight is horrible, but what can he do? He's got absolutely no idea of what the solution might be. He's beside himself. He's insane. Verse 5 says he's cutting himself with stones. He's hurting himself. What does this 
but the carnal mind. Doesn't it remind you of the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel? This is unreasonable, irrational, destructive behavior. He's intent on destroying himself. Do you know Luke 8 and verse 27 adds, he was naked. He's uncovered. He's clearly insane. Matthew chapter 8 verse 28 adds that he was fierce. He's hostile. He's angry. He wants to fight. He will defend his territory. He's combative and dangerous. This is the reptilian brain in action. It's all about preserving self. And back in Mark chapter 5, verse 6 says, Jesus is afar off. He knows, doesn't he, that he's separated from godly things. And he runs up, obviously distressed in verse 7, and he cries with a loud voice and says, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. He admits in verse 7 that he has absolutely nothing in common with Jesus Christ. They're poles apart, completely different. This is the carnal mind coming face to face with the mind of Christ. And there's absolutely no common ground whatsoever. This is an amazing parable. But you see, as horrific as he was, as unclean as he was, as desperately tormented as he was, it seems pretty obvious from the record that Legion had watched from his mountain cave the unbelievable miracle of the stilling of the storm at the end of Mark chapter 4. And he knew there was something incredibly powerful about this man that had arrived on the beach, this man, Jesus Christ. He'd watched in Mark chapter 4 and verse 37, a great storm, a mega storm, become, in verse 39, a great calm. A great calm. And Maybe he wondered, in his own tortured mind, could this man calm the violent storm happening inside my head? Do you know Psalm 65 and verse 7 describes the power of God and it says, Which stilleth the noise of the sea, the noise of the waves, and the tumult of the people. If Christ could still the waves and the storm, if even the wind, verse 41, and the sea obey him, could he bring calm and peace and tranquility? to Legion's tortured mind? It seems likely, doesn't it, that Legion at least knew something because in chapter 5 and verse 6, he did what all of us with the carnal mind need to do. He came and he saw Jesus afar off and he ran and worshipped. Literally, it means he prostrated Himself. He knew he was, in the words of Ephesians 2 verse 12 that we read last night, afar off. But he desperately wanted to be nigh, to be near, to be close, to be accepted. Despite his insanity, he had what we saw last night, a spiritual hunger, an inner yearning for something better. He knew that the solution was not inside himself. He desperately needed Christ. Do you know, it's interesting in this story, Legion was powerless to help or to save himself. And do you know what? As we read Mark chapter 5, it is just so obvious, isn't it? We look at Legion, he's cutting himself, he's irrational, he's unclean, he can't be tamed. No human doctor can relieve his suffering. He's running wild in the mountains. It's obvious. He can't save himself. Look at the stories just before and just after Legion. In Mark chapter 4 and verse 38, in the storm, do you know the disciples were just as powerless to save themselves? Just as powerless as Legion. 
And in the story just after Legion, we've got the woman in chapter 5 and verse 26, who's likewise suffered many things of many physicians and can't be cured, but it's getting worse and worse, progressively corrupted of the truth. And she is powerless to cure herself. herself. Do you know, we are all the same. It was just far more obvious with Legion. He's naked, he's cutting himself, he's crying amongst the graves. But the disciples, well, they seem perfectly sane and respectable. They go to the synagogue on Sunday and they come dressed up in suits and ties. They look perfectly respectable. But all of them, brothers and sisters, disciples, legion and the woman, we are all just as helpless as each other. We all desperately need Christ. And so he threw himself at Christ's feet. And what does Christ do? Verse 13. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. What does he do? Why? He takes the animal, the reptilian brain, and he gives it to the animals. And what did it produce in them? Death. He put the carnal mind, our animal-like thinking, to death. It wasn't cured. It wasn't changed. It was not rehabilitated. It wasn't fixed. It got drowned. Legion has all the hallmarks of the carnal mind, an evil or defiled conscience. And what did Brother Thomas say the obvious indication was? Blot out... Forgive the sin, and the conscience of the patient will be cured. And so what Christ did is he took all of Legion's sins, and in the words of Micah chapter 7 and verse 19, he cast them into the depths of the sea, literally drowned, forgiven. Legion was free. And look at the result, verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed, that was possessed with the demon, and had the legion, sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. It was the power of Christ that could forgive and free and release legion from an evil conscience, the carnal mind, to a good conscience, a spiritual or right mind. It was the power of Christ that could reverse Genesis 3 and verse 10. Sin had entered with Adam and Eve and with it the telltale signs in our lives. We've all felt them, brothers and sisters. Fear, shame, and concealment. How true it is. And now Christ is going to replace concealment with openness. He's not hiding in caves. He's sitting out in the open. He replaces nakedness and shame with clothing, the covering of Christ. And the torment of fear with confidence and peace, a right mind. Mark chapter 5 and verse 15 is the reversal of Genesis 3, verse 10. This is God's promise to replace our carnal mind with a spiritual one. Actually, it's the mind of Christ in us. And how did it come? Look at verse 19. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee. And hath had compassion on thee. Our Lord understands us, brothers and sisters. Remarkably, he could identify with every affliction of Legion's troubled mind. And so it is that with compassion, he orchestrates 
a replacement. He gave Legion a right mind. And when in verse 15, the people come to see Jesus, it says they saw Legion. He had put on Christ. His mind had been changed. They came to see Jesus and they saw a man who had put on Jesus. He had a spiritual mind in type. Offered to all those who prostrate themselves at Christ's feet. Desperate for help and healing and freedom. Brothers and sisters, if we can't see our need, we will never be healed. If we can't see that we are desperately sick, then we're in the wrong place right here. We must all come to a point in our lives when we realise that even though we look like the completely normal, sane, respectable disciples, that we are actually legion, afflicted, tormented by a mind we cannot escape and it's destroying our lives and we come to fall prostrate before him this morning to approach this table and to say, we desperately need him. We choose just to be near. We choose to draw nigh, to beg to be set free. And do you know that choice that we each have is right here in the story. See how Mark chapter 5 divides people into two groups. The presence of our Lord Jesus Christ divides us into two groups. Legion is transformed. No more fear, no more shame, no more concealment. But look at the people who, despite the miracle, couldn't see their need. Verse 15, they were afraid. Verse 16, they're still ashamed about their swine. In verse 17, they want to hide themselves by pushing Christ away. They're unchanged. They're unaffected. They are unforgiven. How thankful can we be, brothers and sisters, that we can see the lesson and know our true state and need before this beautiful man of compassion. So what is the lesson from our story today? We all have a hideous deformity the carnal mind, an evil conscience. But what legion is able to show us is that this is not God's will for us. Do you know Deuteronomy 5 and verse 29 puts it this way in the Revised Standard Version. Oh, that they had such a mind as this to fear me and to keep my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their children forever. And God pleads with the nation, oh, that it might be that they had a mind such as this. It's God's desire that we abandon our carnal minds, that we throw ourselves at Christ's feet. And his promise is that if we do, he will cast our tortured evil conscience, the result of our sins, into the depths of the sea. Give us a right mind, a spiritual mind, the mind of Christ. We all have a mind that cannot be rehabilitated. But here's the marvelous thing. We're just like Legion. We can't earn a spiritual mind. We can't develop it ourselves by our own strength. We are the problem. Not the solution. Remember, I looked and there was no man. None of us can bring about in ourselves and of ourselves a spiritual mind. It is Christ in us. It doesn't matter how much hard work or study we put in, although these are absolutely necessary. We can't try harder to get it. The mind of Christ, the spiritual mind, is quite simply a magnificent gift. I want you just to think for a moment about the prodigal son. Remember there were two boys in that story? The elder son, why well, he thought he could earn salvation. I've worked on the farm all these years. You never gave me a party. I deserve it. I've earned the right for my father to give me something. And do you know what the younger son does? 
He's done terrible things. He's been afflicted by the carnal mind. He comes to himself. There's a moment of reflection. He comes to himself. And he decides he's going to go back to his father. He decides he's going to say to his father, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of thy hired servants. And he gets his speech ready. And he goes back home. And his father sees him coming afar off. And he says, Father, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But before he can say, Make me one of thy hired servants, his father interrupts. And he says, Bring forth the robe, kill the fatted calf, bring forth, let us rejoice. Son, you can't be a hired servant and earn what I'm going to give you. It is a gift. I'd like you to come to Ephesians chapter 1. The gift of our Heavenly Father is something we can never earn. Verse 17 to 19 of Ephesians 1. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. The enlightenment of our eyes. This amazing calling to have Christ's mind in us is God giving to us the spirit of wisdom. It's a gift, brothers and sisters. It's a gift. Do you know 1 John 5 and verse 20 says this in Young's literal translation. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given given us a mind to know Him that is true. What a gift. He's given us a mind to know Him that is true. Indescribable. Sitting, clothed, and in His right mind was a gift from the Son of God, received by legion and refused by others. I'd like you to come to our reading this morning, 1st of Corinthians in chapter 2. It's the quintessential reading, I suppose, on the mind of Christ. It's the verse in the Bible where the mind of Christ occurs. And we read in 1st of Corinthians 2, verse 9, these words. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. This is my favorite verse in the whole of the Bible. This is God's purpose for us, his will for us to give us something that's indescribable. You remember last night we referred to Isaiah 55 when we said, my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways and thoughts higher than yours. God's character and his plans are beyond us. We cannot ever hope to comprehend them. And Legion couldn't even comprehend what a spiritual mind looked like. He couldn't imagine what life would be like without torment. Being in his right mind, he couldn't even comprehend that. He just desperately knew that he needed something, and he prostrated himself before Christ, begging for help. We've got to be like him, brothers and sisters. We need to have what Mark 10 and verse 15 describes as the humility of a little child to just receive the kingdom. You know when you give a present or a gift to a little child, they don't ever say, how can I pay you back, or how can I make this up to you. No, they receive it as a gift. But we have to have humility. We can't earn it. 
It's freely given. Verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man. It's a no man prophecy. But the Spirit of God, now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. The crowds couldn't receive what legion received. For they, it's foolishness unto them. Neither can they know them because they are spiritually discerned. But we, at the end of verse 16, have the mind of Christ. The gift, brothers and sisters, has already been given. It's on the table before us this morning. And the question that we each need to ask is, are we meek enough to receive it? Because it's all about whether we can receive it or not. Not whether we earn it, but whether we receive it. Do you know James 1 in verse 21 says that if we receive with meekness the engrafted word, it can save our souls. But 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10 says that the wicked will not be saved because they receive not the love of the truth. It's just that simple. Simply receiving this gift is the difference between life and death. What a calling. We have to be humble enough to accept God's gift. This is how Brother Thomas finishes. To surrender unconditionally with the humility and teachableness of a child to receive with open heart and grateful feelings whatever in the wisdom and justice and benevolence of God he may condescend to prescribe this brothers and sisters is how we overcome our desperate sickness we open our hearts to receive God's medicine, the gift of a new mind. <clears throat> I'd like you to come in conclusion to Hebrews in chapter 8. As we draw our attention to the emblems before us. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. <clears throat> For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Do you know, brothers and sisters, our God was prepared to sacrifice, to crucify his son. To get this into our minds. And look what it says in the margin. I will give. Not put. I will give my law into their minds. This is God's promise. To give us a spiritual mind. To give his law into our minds as a gift. To share with us the mind of his son. What an amazing thing. What an amazing thing. How grateful ought we to be, brothers and sisters, that our Heavenly Father has the answer to our carnal minds, our evil consciences. He desperately wants us to be sitting, clothed, and in our right mind. This is His solution. This is His promise, His offer. We come here to this table to reflect on this offer graciously renewed for another week.
And all we have to do, brothers and sisters, as we break bread and drink wine to remember his promise this day is to throw ourselves at his feet and to say, we desperately need him to ask him to forgive our foolish ways, to reclothe us in our rightful mind. To have the simple trust to let our strivings cease. And to let our newly ordered lives confess the beauty of his peace.